Hello, everybody. I just completed a PhD from the University of South Florida in uh, Tampa. And today I will be talking about framing the invariant from um, homology of ternary subdistributed structures. So, on works, uh, joint works with uh, Mohamed al and my Saiko Saido, also uh, part of my dissertation and some ongoing projects, uh, one of which is with my Saiko Saido and one is uh, by myself. Um, some references are um, these uh, two papers, one on archive and the other one is uh, going to appear in general algebra and application and my PhD dissertation. The organization of the talk is as follows. I will start to talk about um, um, algebraic structures such as uh, self-distributive structures, so bundles, racks, and shelves, and their connections to uh, Young-Baxter um, uh, operators. I will describe the, their cohomology theories, the cohomology theory of quandles, and I will uh, give the definition of cocycle invariance and how to construct this cocycle invariance of uh, links from uh, cohomology of uh, binary quandles. I will also um, say how to see the cocycle invariance as a quantum invariance by building a, an appropriate um, yetter dreamfeld module. And uh, I will pass, therefore, to discuss ternary self-distributive structures and their cohomology theory. I will describe how to um, construct a cocycle invariant of um, framed links from ternary self-distributive cohomology. And therefore, I will pass to talk how about um, some algebraic results of cohomology of uh, ternary self-distributive structures, and more particularly also some uh, heap cohomology, where heaps are a particular kind of um, ternary self-distributive uh, structures. Um, therefore, I will pass to talk about um, categorical um, uh, heaps and categorical distributivity and I will give some examples arising from this reason to try to extend the cycle environment or frame links for um distributive operation to a quantum invariant for some constructing an appropriate category, an appropriate ribbon category, and um, endomorphisms in this ribbon category. So, uh, in a nutshell, the um, meaning of this talk is that when you use binary operations to construct a cocycle invariance of uh, links, you cannot encode the framing of the links due to the fact that the binary operation of a quandle is idempotent, as we will see shortly. This idempotency doesn't allow you to take into consideration link uh, framing because if you see the framing as a, as a so the twisting as a self-intersection of, of an arc with itself, any coloring, um, as we will see later, due to the idempotency doesn't change um, after self-crossing. So we don't have a way to encode also the framing into uh, the cocycle invariant. But if you pass to the ternary point of view, a self-intersection will produce a twisting which is non-trivial. This will also be seen to, with the fact that if you, when you construct the ribbon category from, from a ternary um, self-distributive structure, the twisting is non-trivial. And this doesn't happen when you construct the cocycle invariant of, uh, from a binary structure um, as a quantum invariant, because the ribbon category, the in, the, in this case is a yetter dreamfeld module, has a trivial twisting. So also, I will show that you can use heaps, which are ternary self-distributive structures that, in some sense, they cannot be reduced to compositions of binary operations. So they are uh, purely ternary structures. And um, I will um, talk about how to define the ternary um, uh, cocycle invariants as a quantum invariant. So let me start from uh, the algebraic definitions. 
recall that a quandle is a set along with a binary operation that is idempotent, which is first axiom. When you fix one element and, uh, you, and define the right multiplication map, this is a bijection, whatever element you pick in the, in the quandle. And also the binary operation satisfies these um, self-distributivity axiom. Uh, a structure that satisfies just the third axiom is called shelf. Uh, something that satisfies third and second uh, axioms is called uh, rack. And the, um, something that satisfies the three axioms is called quando. These three axioms correspond to Reitmeister moves of type one, two, and three in uh, knot theory. So they are an algebraic point of view of, of, these, um, of uh, these, the Reitmeister moves. Uh, examples of quandles are a group with the uh, operation given by conjugation. So this is somehow the epitomic example of um, quandle. Uh, also, a cyclic group always gives rise to a um, to we have a module of a Moreover, this is a this can be seen as a particular case of a group with an automorphism. A quando automatically gives rise to, to a young Baxter operator by introducing this switching and on the second entry uh, applying the, uh, this uh, y, the second entry of the domain to, the, to x using the operation here and a linearizing, of course. This um, operation is seen as call, um, uh, giving labels to the arcs of the of a diagram of a, of a knot and in each crossing the arc that is underpassing um, changes the label to the one given by the operation of the overpassing acting on the underpassing so this is the diagrammatic interpretation that allows you to pass from um, the, this uh, algebraic point of view to the not theoretic point of view and uh, to construct also the co-cycle environment, as we will see shortly. To define a homology theory and a cohomology theory, you can uh, define n tuples over the um, over the quandle x. Take the free abelian groups generated group generated by the n tuples, and then you can define differentials as the sum with the appropriate sign of these two terms, where the first one is a simplicial one, where you just delete the ith entry, and the second one is the one that encodes also the quandle um, uh, operation, as you see here. Not only am I deleting the, um, the ith entry, but I'm also um, applying the ith entry to the first um, i minus one um, entries. You can see that, that the composition of the differ this differential with itself uh, squares to zero, so it gives you actually a homology theory. So upon dualizing, you get a cohomology theory and uh, there is a normalization process going on, meaning that you basically simply quotient out um, uh, chains that are that are repeated that have repeated entries with the i and i plus one. This is due to the fact that the quandle operation is uh, idempotent, so um, you can quotient out by these chains because they are um, they give a subchain complex. So in order to define the cocycle invariant, we need uh, colorings of uh, diagrams by by quandles. Uh, this you do by taking a diagram of a knot or a link and um, defining a map from, from the arcs to a uh, quandle that respects the compatibility, meaning that if you um, basically, um, if you have a color a coloring determined by a crossing and the same color is determined also by another crossing, the two colors has to coincide. So the coloring is well defined once you apply the operation and therefore one, when you apply the um, right Meister moves to the diagram, um, the colorings is, is uh, well defined basically. 
fix a two cosigon. So assume that you can compute the quantum um, cohomology at least at level two, and uh, you have two cosigons. You you fix one, and at each crossing you can define. Each crossing is oriented, and it gives you um, a sign, and you can define phi of x y where x and y are the arcs that they are meeting at that crossing. And you define this Boltzmann weight for each crossing tau, and then multiply all of them together because um, A is assumed to be a ring, so you can have the multiplication of all of them. Sorry, it's a, it's a group. So you can multiply all of them together, and then you take the sum over all the colorings of, these, um, of the diagram of this knot. Um, this is seen to be an invariant, and also it lives inside the group ring of of, uh, of A. So yes, the Boltzmann state sum is uh, invariant under right Meister moves. So basically, it's an invariant of uh, links. In actually, in the definition I gave, it's just for one component knots, but you can define it for links by taking a vector in which each entry li uh, lives inside the group ring and um, refers to one of the components of the link. Moreover, if you take two cosigons that they are uh, that are uh, co-bounded, the difference in in computing the the Boltzmann state sum is simply an integer multiple of the of uh, of the identity in the um, group ring. So up to um, integers multiples of of um, of the identity. Uh, this is well defined for uh, for um, cosigons within the same um, cohomology class. So I said you can consider this invariant as a quantum invariant. To do so, you, you use the um, uh, quantum operation to define the Yetter Dreamfeld modules, uh, where you basically switch the entries and apply the operation and also multiply by the, um, uh, by the cosigon. And um, it turns out that these, um, these uh, if you take the quantum invariant corresponding to, to the Yetter Dreamfeld module, so whenever you have a diagram of a link, you can construct a, an endomorphism. And uh, if you take the trace, this is going to be um, uh, the same as doing the cosigon invariant. The interesting thing here is that the twist of this Yetter Dreamfeld module seen as a ribbon category is trivial. So this is why if you consider this invariant as a framing invariant, it doesn't detect any framing at all. And this is the starting point basically of this work. We would like to have a way of detecting not only the isotopic class of, of, the, of, the, um, of the knot or link, but we also want to detect the framing. So what are ternary racks and quandles? Um, uh, it's, this is a generalization of the binary case. Um, you can do it for n structures. In fact, in the paper, um, the first paper in the references I gave before, um, this is done for n self-distributed structures. In this case, since I'm going to focus on their applications to cosigon invariants, and these use just um, um, the ternary version, I will focus just on, on the ternary definition. Well, it itself distributed with respect to two entries. Now it's ternary operation. You don't have just a binary operation. So what distributes is not just one element, but it's pairs of elements. If you fix the second and third entry and let the first entry vary, you get a bijection and you get it for all Y's and Z's. And um, also, this is a sort of ternary version of the Alvide impotency. So if I apply T to a triple, which is the same element repeated three times, I get X, uh, the same element again. Well, examples of uh, racks and, and uh, quandles. Um, racks, uh, sorry, I didn't mention this. Racks is when um, a ternary rack is something that satisfies just first and second axiom. So no idempotency, similar, analogous to the binary case. So one easy way and the easiest way to do to create a ternary self-distributive operation is to uh, just iterate a binary operation which is self-distributive. You see that um, uh, this ternary operation defined like this as a composition of binary operation with itself satisfies ternary self-distributivity. 
more interesting is um, the hip of a group. More interesting because I will show later that even if you don't use the same binary operation, there are some, some binary self-distributive operations that satisfy some sort of condition that I will describe in the next slide that give rise to a ternary operation. But heap of a group never arises as a um, um, composition of binary operations. You can show that this is somehow um, purely ternary without having the possibility of decomposing it in the, in the composition of two binary operations. So um, if you have two binary operations that satisfy this mutual distributivity that was in the, introduced by Josef Tritiski, what you obtain by um, composing them is a ternary operation which is self-distributive. Um, the diagrammatic interpretation of a ternary operation here is the following. When in the binary case, one arc passes one string and changes uh, color, changes the name of the arc to the operation X star Y. Here in this case, one string passes beneath a ribbon, which uh, is determined by two arcs. And um, this time is the ternary operation that gives its name. In this vector notation, it's just a shorthand to, 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 to make the, the notation a little bit um, lighter. Uh, so when we will see later that when you have um, a blackboard framing of a framed link, basically then you are underpassing um, a ribbon beneath another ribbon. So you can do this thing twice. You can double this procedure and this thing will give you a coloring of, of um, the blackboard framing. So, this is the proof, I inverted the slides, unfortunately, but yeah, this is the proof of the previous slide I was mentioning that, that um, composition of binary operations give rise to um, um, a ternary self-distributive operation. It depends simply on using in, in the appropriate order. Um, uh, it's quite an easy proof to um, use uh, in the appropriate order the self-distributivity and mutual distributivity of the operation star zero and star one. You can iterate this pro procedure and also do higher order, um, higher RIT self-distributive operation. So if I have uh, three binary operation, in this case, I have um, four entries because I'm using the operation three times. So I can have also four, uh, um, four, uh, four um, an operation with four entries, which is self-distributive. And more generally, as I say, these uh, sort of results, they apply for also NRI and MRI self-distributive operations, but I will not go into the, any description of the higher version of these uh, ter binary ternary um, uh, scheme. So this construction is also, is also functorial, which is a very interesting thing because this allows you to pass from the category of mutually distributive um, structures, somehow defined, I didn't uh, put any details here, to the category of ternary self-distributive structures, which is pretty easy to imagine what it is. It's simply uh, sets with ternary self-distributive structures and uh, um, morphisms are those maps that respect the operation. This is very useful to construct also coloring. So somehow it translate whatever you had in binary terms to ternary terms whenever the two binary operations are mutually distributive and so are well defined. Uh, an interesting fact is that if I invert the, the order of composition, if I, um, if I define T as star zero composition star one, or I define another T as star one composition star zero, the two operations might well be different in the sense that I obtain non-isomorphic objects. So how about cohomology? We are going to talk about um, co-cycle invariants. So we need the notion of co-cycle and we need the notion of cohomology. Uh, this cohomology theory actually was introduced in the NRE um, setting for, um, um, by Matthew Green at, uh, in his uh, PhD dissertation at University of South Florida. 
You can define, um, in this case, instead of n tuples, you need 2n plus 1 tuples because the operation is going to use two elements each time acting on one, so three elements each time instead of just two. And the differential is pretty analogous to the binary case here. Instead of deleting one entry, I delete a pair. And then I subtract and uh, what I do, I delete the pair and I let it act on, uh, on all the previous elements. Uh, this should be 2n, there is a title here. So, what allows you to pass from, from the, from the, um, from the cohomology point of view to the diagrammatic point of view is the fact that when you have a frank knot, you can, the diagrammatics that uh, govern uh, the topology, they are given by these blackboard framings, where a twisting is simply given by self-crossing with itself, and then if I pull it, it is introduced uh, and twistings, depending on how many uh, self-intersections I'm doing. And um, the, the diagrammatic interpretation that I showed before is um, will correspond with Boltzmann sums exactly to the binary version. So this is how the diagrammatics plays a role in order to define the cosigol invariant. Well, this is this is it. I, I take a Boltzmann sum as um, um, by taking at each crossing, as I say, the double um, of the of the um, of the cocycle at each time with the, the appropriate sign. So what I obtain in this case is this product uh, is going to live inside. The, um, um, it's a product of two elements in the in the um, cross product in the, of the, of the group of the coefficient group, and then I sum over the colorings. So in general, since um, the group ring of uh, Cartesian product of groups is isomorphic to the tensor product of the of the um, group um, rings, this is this uh, Boltzmann sum is going to live in the tensor product of the group ring with itself, where where a group is is going to be the the coefficient group of cohomology. So the diagrammatics allows me to define this uh, Boltzmann sum, and this is going to be an invariant on frame link. Of course, to show it, I have to show invariance with respect to the, to the diagrammatic moves of uh, frame links that are R2, R3. And then instead of R1, I have uh, the fact that uh, one king, um, a positive king, and a negative king, they kill each other, and I can basically smooth and straighten up the arc. So you can verify by, um, by direct computation that, that the invariant so defined satisfies all these, um, um, all the properties. So we are doing co-cycle invariants. So using cohomology of, um, of uh, ternary self-distributed structures, we would like to be able to do computations. So when the ternary structure arises as a, as a composition of binary structures, I can define a cohomology theory. Um, actually, a homology theory was dualization gives you a cohomology theory that relates the, the cohomology of uh, uh, the summons of each structure with, a, with its own binary operation to the, to the cohomology of the ternary operation where the composition gives the ternary operation. This procedure is given by, I didn't write the differentials, it's um, the, the most interesting part, the highlight is the fact that you can construct this structure by labeling the operations depending on what, um, so each element is labeled by what operation is going to act, to use to act upon the previous elements um, in the formulas. And once you split these, um, the chain complex or cochain complex in this direct sum, um, the differentials, they split into the direct sum as well. But if you compose the differential twice, so you do the delta square, the differentials, they recompose all in the right way and they give you zero. So it's a well-defined homology theory and cohomology theory. So you split them in a way that, that, that is appropriate so that you can give 
you, you can obtain back the delta squared zero uh, at the end. And this uh, relation gives you a way to pass from cohomology of the binary operations by themselves to the cohomology of the ternary operation obtained by composing them. So for instance, if you know cohomology, second cohomology group of um, Alexander quandos, you can take two different Alexander quandos that they mutually distribute, and this, the cohomology of the ternary operation can be studied by the cohomology of the two Alexander quantums. So it's a way of studying ternary cohomology without starting from zero. But, um, but uh, well, I say that heaps, they cannot be decomposed into uh, smaller pieces. So a ternary uh, operation, which is a heap, cannot be obtained as a composition of binary operations. So the previous construction leaves completely open how to compute um, cohomology of heaps. Well, um, the fundamental idea here is that since heaps are uh, fundamentally uh, determined by by uh, groups uh, there is a, a theorem that says that the um, uh, category of pointed heaps is isomorphic to the is equivalent to the category of uh, groups uh, it, this identification is not canonical because I have to choose the pointing for, for each heap. I choose one element and then I get an, an identification for each choice I make. So this tells me that basically um, group heaps are uh, somehow uh, sort of the most general example of heaps. So the idea here is that I might try to use a group cohomology in this case to construct a cohomology of heaps in some appropriate sense. And then I can try to, since heaps are ternary self-distributive, I can try to use this uh, uh, heap cohomology to construct um, self-distributive cohomology of heaps. So these, um, this procedure allows you to use um, uh, results from uh, group theory. There is going to be a little detail, meaning that the coefficients are going to be twisted and used as um, heaps here. And this thing kind of makes a little bit more difficult to apply directly this scheme. Um, anyway, so a heap uh, formally defined is a parasociative uh, operation where parasociativity means these three equalities and uh, they are not independent. Uh, two of them imply the, the other one. Whichever you choose, the other one uh, comes for free. And if um, it satisfies this degeneracy condition, then it's called heap. Um, well, let's start. There are various ways of thinking of cohomology of heaps. The first one and most natural one, because it's strongly related to group theory, is um, this one, where basically you look at the cohomology uh, of, of uh, groups and you try to apply um, the same scheme for, uh, for replacing ternary operations to binary operations. In this case, is uh, I'm doing homology, but uh, dualizing, you get the cohomology theory. And uh, this cohomology and homology are called uh, uh, type zero because I'm using just the first of the equations, which we called in this paper with the uh, lambda and Saito, we called it um, a type zero uh, equation. But in general, you can do cohomology by using also other of all the equalities. So um, this leads to splitting the chain complex into a direct sum where each di uh, direct sum encodes um, one of the three equalities. Um, this is the second differential um, uh, which classifies basically the, the, the second PA cohomology, PA being a parasociative, uh, classifies a, a parasociative extensions of a, of a structure, exactly like in group theory, basically. The third differential, it's, uh, it, it kind of degenerates in, in uh, length of the equation. So I just wrote, I just um, um, put the figure that, um, from which you can kind of understand how to define them. Um, this follows the same idea that allows you to, to take, the, take 
the diagrammatics that bring you to the definition of a Hochschild cohomology, basically, where here is kind of um, uh, these um, ternary trees, they represent the, the operation. So this is the operation of the heap applied to um, of one, two, and three entries. And then applying, you, you can apply the second equality or the first equality, and you see you can apply different kind of equalities at each step, but somehow, the confluence diagram has to um, be satisfied and um, this gives you by um, algebraically writing these uh, these conditions you get what are the, what uh, differentials would be and you can verify that they've satisfied uh, the condition of uh, delta square equals zero well i claim that you can understand somehow uh, heap cohomology using other types of cohomology and you can relate all uh, self-distributed cohomology, heap cohomology and uh, group cohomology. So a few results that relate them, for instance, there is a long exact sequence um, that relates uh, homology and uh, also cohomology of uh, type zero heaps and, and, um, and a group. And the interesting fact is that these relative homology and cohomology they might be not zero so in general this is not an isomorphism the two theories they are not uh, exactly the same i mean they they are related but they are not um, redundant basically also very useful is the fact that you can inject um, the heap cohomology inside the ternary self-distributive cohomology so if somehow you are able to compute the second uh, heap cohomology group then you for free can understand something about self-distributive cohomology also there is here another uh, this theorem that relates uh, cohomology of groups and parasociative uh, cohomology from uh, this is um, the justification of this theorem comes from ext extension theory. So um, this is part of the work I'm, I'm, I'm doing with the Masahiko Saito right now. We are trying to do some computations, um, the practical computations, and it turns out that homology and cohomology of, of self-distributive uh, self homology and cohomology of heaps they split in two um, terms. One we call degenerate and the other one non-degenerate, where um, the degenerate one um, kind of encodes the monochromatic heap coloring. So it gives you non-trivial non uh, contributions in the uh, frame link invariance when you color with the same colors. And these um, uh, colorings actually, and this cohomology, um, gives you interesting results even when you are not using colorings with different colors, which is quite interesting. The non-degenerate part, which is more complicated to, to, con to compute, gives you the polychromatic um, uh, colorings of the diagram. So uh, it turns out that the degenerate part, in fact, you can characterize it completely based on the action uh, over, over X cross X of some sort of uh, doubled action, basically, of X on, on its double. Um, so the, the degenerate part is uh, easy to, to understand what's happening. The non-degenerate part is the one that is more troubling, but still there are some results you can get. I mean, you can basically construct these um, these um, subcomplexes that are localized at one group. So you take all the cosets coming from a subgroup of, of X and these, uh, and they turn out to define subcomplexes with respect to the heap operation. And um, it turns out that the second cohomology group of the relative cohomology injects into the non-degenerate cohomology group. This is just a level two. So relative cohomology gives you in, gives you non-degenerate, non-trivial second cohomology groups. And this is particularly interesting because even if you are not able to do the whole compute computation, so you cannot compute the localized part, for instance, or if you can compute the relative part and the localized one, you cannot put them back together to get the whole computation of the non-degenerate cohomology. At level two, at least, since the relative cohomology um, has um, satisfies equivalence with respect to the subgroup G, it has some it has some symmetries that help you doing computations. So you can do nice computations out of this group, 
and therefore you can understand some non-trivial seg um, uh, second uh, two cycles. And this is very useful for the for the uh, computations of uh, frame link invariants since um, they use two cycle um, uh, two cycles of of uh, ternary self distributive structures. So we have some uh, preliminary computation. Trivial two co cycles, which is great because it's very good for computation. It can arise from cyclic heaps, from dihedral heaps, sorry, and um, in the associated ternary co cycles, they seem not to be trivial. So we still are doing many computations, but from what we have seen, it seems that that this um, uh, invariant it actually detects something. So you can get information out of it uh, by computing uh, the co-cycle invariant. Well, now whoever has experienced knows that one of the main reasons in the 80s that they have become popular in knot theory, um, it was that, that you can define what is called fundamental quando of a knot. Whenever you have a diagram, fix a diagram of a knot, you can, you can take um, the presentation of, of this, uh, of this um, diagram with arcs and you can generate what is called fundamental quando. And this is a complete invariant up to orientation and uh, mirror image. So um, one might ask the same question about heaps. So is there a way to construct something that is the heap analog to frame links of a fundamental quando to um, uh, links in general? Well, you can do it. So in this case, the, the arcs, they will give you the alphabet. At each crossing, you will introduce a relation that is dictated by a, a heap-like operation. And then this gives you a bunch of relators. You can define a group with the presentation given by the alphabet corresponding to the arcs. Um, relators given by the heap operations at the, at the crossings. And then if you take this group and consider it as a, as a heap, what you have is an invariant of frame links. So um, we also did some computations. We are, we are still computing, but it seems that you can, um, uh, you can get some nice results about torus knots, uh, pretzel links with, um, with the odd crossings. But um, of course, these, these presentations become quite difficult to deal with. So you might will be interested in looking at quotients of these structures. I mean, the, the presentations are not used uh, information out of it. Now I will, I will uh, pass to, uh, to the categorical self-distributivity. Uh, these it might look like a, a pernicious um, exercise, but in fact, it's quite justified. It's very interesting, at least to me, because um, you, can, you can obtain objects that satisfy the, a sort of self-distributivity, but not in the category of sets, but in more general categories. So if you would like at the end of, uh, of the day to do a quantum invariance, that gives you the possibility of doing it in some structures with, um, with the operations coming from uh, Lie algebras, for instance, and Hopf algebras. I, I will show examples from Lie and Hopf algebras. So these give, um, these give you a very nice um, family of examples that is not necessary. It's not easy to to think of when you when you live in the set theoretic world. So um, to generalize of distributivity to any category, you just uh, you you can replace the axioms by diagrams of these sorts in the in the category. Uh, the category is assumed to be symmetric monoidal. Um, where you need the symmetry because you have to switch the order of the elements. If you remember once, for instance, even the binary case, Z splits, but then it switches with Y. So you have X star Y star Z becomes X star Z star Y star Z. So one copy of Z switched with Y. So in the categorical setting, you need a switching map. 
you can think of doing that in a braided monoidal category, of course. And you say, I mean, why I, I don't want a switching map that the squares to zero, which is basically what a symmetric monoidal category is, but I would like something that it's braided. I'm not sure what you get. I, I have no examples, but you can do it. The constructions work, but I'm not sure uh, how useful it would be right now. But maybe if we think more about it, it might be interesting too. Examples from Lie algebras, they come, uh, this example appeared um, uh, before in, in a paper of uh, Carter, um, um, Elamnadi, Saito, um, in the journal uh, Lee um, of, um, I think, I, I forgot the journal, I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, Anyway, you you take a Lie algebra, you are you add you add one copy of the of the ground field, and then you basically extend by linearity this operation where you use both binary operation and um, repeated binary operation. Uh, part of this definition appeared in the original construction of Carter Lambda Saito, but here you can um, you add also a sort of ternary part, uh, introducing also this iterated bracket. So this leads you um, automatically to thinking, okay, instead of having a ternary bracket that arises from composition of binary brackets, why not using a ternary bracket on its uh, own? Something that satisfies, for instance, the ternary Philippe of identity. Or even, why not using a, um, a homotopy algebra up to level three? And uh, this can be done also there. Of course, I, I think I, I didn't go that far, but I believe it's a very interesting direction to study. Hopf example. This is very natural in, in, um, uh, from in uh, its uh, nature, because if you think that, that um, a group in, uh, in, um, in the category of sets, when you consider it um, a group-like object in the, in the category of vector spaces, for instance, is an of algebra um, kind of object. So if you can do the heap of, of a group, why not trying to do some heap-like uh, operation on a Hopf algebra? Well, if you do this, it, it turns out that what you obtain, uh, well, of course, you replace the inverse by the antipode. And um, it turns out that what you get is actually a ternary self-distributive object in the, in the category of, of um, vector spaces, for instance, where, um, where um, the ternary self-distributivity is meant in the, in the categorical sense I talked about in a, in a few, few slides before. Also, this shows a good way, a good principle to define ternary augmented racks. Uh, augmented racks, in general, they are important examples of racks in the binary case, and they give you a way of thinking of uh, generalizing to, to the ternary setting. So um, here there is an action of, um, uh, of uh, H on, on X, and, um, and you have this map from X tensor 2 to H, so basically it's like doubling the, um, uh, the the map that gives you the augment uh, the augmentation map in an augmented binary rack, and this turns out to be ternary self distributive, and it gives very interesting examples as well. Some uh, general results about um, these uh, categorical heaps. They are, if you remember, I was talking about the fact that the category of pointed heaps. Uh, is equivalent to the category of groups. Now, in this philosophy, if I take um, uh, Hopf monoids, so objects that behave like Hopf algebras in a category, and I do the heap exactly how I defined it in the case of a Hopf algebra, basically Hopf monoid has all the data that allows me to do the heap operation in Hopf algebra. So I get a category of pointed uh, Hopf monoids, which are assumed to be involuntary in this case for for um, some uh, technical reasons and and the categories are uh, turn out to be to be equivalent so so this is a sort of um, more abstract version of what the set theoretic settings was um, um, what else of course a heap in, in, the, in general was considered because it's a ternary self-distributive um, um, 
structure. Now, if I have these e objects, I would like to, to prove that they actually, in a symmetric monoidal category, I would like to know if, whether or not they are ternary self-distributive in C, in the meaning of uh, categorical self-distributivity. Uh, it turns out that, that, that this is the case. You can prove that this is actually the case. Well, now to you can take the cocycle invariant in the in the binary case, and then you can construct a Yeter Dreamfeld module, and then somehow this this uh, quantum version of of the of the um, of the invariant associated to the Yeter Dreamfeld module gives you back the cocycle invariants. Um, how about in the ternary setting? Can you can you can you do the same here? Well, it turns out that yes, you can. So you can construct a category um, out of a self-distributive object, and you can use the um, you can define the braiding where alpha is is a is a cocycle, and the twisting where theta is, uh, where alpha is again a fixed co two cocycle, and um, the braiding is based on the diagrammatic interpretation and it's similar to how you define the Yeter Greenfield module in the binary case. And the twist is based on self-intersection, thinking that when you pull it, it gives you twists. So this category is uh, it's, um, it's a ribbon category. And it turns out that I f if I, of course, a natural question is like, what happens if I, instead of taking one, two co-cycle, I switch to another co-cycle, which is a representative of the same cohomology class. If things go well, what I would like to happen is that um, the two categories, they are somehow the same. And uh, this is true. I mean, the, the two categories are equivalent, meaning that there is a, um, there is a um, fully faithful functor from one to the other. This fully faithful functor is induced by a, the, um, the map F that, co that gives the co-bounding of alpha minus beta. Because by definition, alpha minus beta being zero, it means that there is a one co-chain that co-bounds uh, the difference. And, um, and this is exactly what you use to define the, the, fun the functor that passes from one category to the other one. So in other words, choose your favorite co-cycle in the, within one non-trivial cohomology class and uh, you're done. Um, one thing worth mentioning here is that twists are not um, trivial in, in this case. And this is exactly the same reason why the co-cycle invariant uh, encodes also the framing, because self-crossing is not idempotent now and therefore gives you non-trivial twisting. The same thing happens here. If you try to do this in the, in the uh, binary case, what you get is that idempotency gives you that, that twisting is, is trivial. But in this case, the twisting it would not be trivial and, um, and uh, this is basically quite interesting and gives you how to, to have frame link invariants that take into account also, also framing. So this uh, ribbon hop, uh, so, pardon, this uh, ribbon category allows you to construct an invariant of frame link, but also um, the way it is constructed, it, it is interesting by itself because once you have um, a, um, a frame link, this is represented by a frame braid and the, the, as a closure of a frame braid. So if you have a frame braid, this has a certain number of, of uh, strings on tops and on, on the bottom. So you can interpret this frame, you can make it correspond this uh, frame braid to a um, endomorphism of the, of, the ca of the ribbon category. And this is the whole trick. And then once you close it up, it's kind of a Markov theorem, basically. Once you close it up, you get uh, the quantum trace. But this, um, the endomorphism itself 
not only um, uh, does it help, does it give you this theorem, which when you close it and you get the quantum trace, it coincides with the co-cycle environment, but also it's also an environment by itself in its own right. So even if you are not able to compute uh, two co-cycles, at the end of the day, you if you have a ternary operation, when you if you instead of closing consider the endomorphism, this is a non-trivial, in general, is a non-trivial endomorphism of an object into itself in the ribbon category. So even if you're not using cohomology, you're, for instance, you're using uh, trivial cohomology, this endomorphism still gives you some sort of information which is non-trivial. And this is quite interesting. Of course, if you close it up, then the cosycle invariant uh, corresponds to the cosycle invariant coming out from um, uh, trivial um, uh, cohomology. And as I said before, it's this would be just a multiple of the identity, an integer multiple of the identity into the the, um, the ground uh, group ring, group ring. So this is not going to give you much information. But anyway. If you have a non-trivial co-cycle, still even closing and taking the quantum trace gives you something which is non-trivial, and it might be um, it is quite interesting to study this thing. I'm I'm currently working on this direction, and I have uh, some computations and some uh, and some um, results. They're they're quite interesting. I'm still um, there. There's there there are still they still need to be checked, so I didn't add them here, but I hope to, to finalize and be sure about these results uh, shortly after redoing the computations carefully a uh, few times. Um, so this is pretty much what I had to say. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this uh, talk. I will be happy to answer to any questions if I can in the comments. And thank you so much to our, the um, to to the organizers for for this opportunity and for um, for organizing this um, seminars.